It's recording. I was born in 1938, Chicago, Illinois. Grew up in Tennessee. Your name? My name is David Landreth Van Vactor. This is a. I'm. Four months ago, I wrote longhand, though I, I'm a fortunate, I mean, a, a victim of about nine strokes. I can still have my, the use of my right hand. I wrote longhand the, the biography of my father, who was uh, one of the best composers in, in America and a symphony conductor, and played Chicago, flew to the Chicago Symphony for 13 seasons. He uh, died almost a couple of weeks shy of 88 years old. Uh, he grew up very poor, born in 1906 in Argus, Indiana, Plymouth County. He was actually born in Plymouth, grew up in Argus, a town of a thousand people in northern Indiana, near, near uh, South Bend. I like to put the, the context, I like to put uh, his family at the time of his birth, 1906. Uh, his grandfather, Hiram, had 15, he and his wife, wife or wives had 15 children, seven of whom died of tuberculosis. Also, what do you mean wives? Well, I mean, I, th I don't know, that, I don't know that, uh, I mean, that you mean there was only one wife, mother of, of, of these 15 children, but seven of them died of tuberculosis, called consumption in those days. All right, very important to put it in this context. Uh, my grandfather, David Ellsworth Van Vactor, was six foot four and his Two brothers, Tyner, and, an, and a, another one of his brothers, came back from the First World War, destroyed, practically destroyed, from mustard gas. And he had to come out as a pacifist against the America going into the First World War. Who would come up? My grandfather. He was a preacher at that time. And as well as built about 400 houses in the town of Argus. And he had a, a little factory making porch columns. The town came out and painted his factory yellow. He got no more business. They became extremely poor. They really were worried if they were have enough food to put on the table for, for five children. My grandmother couldn't get pregnant until, I mean, this is a kind of old wise table, tale that if you adopt children, you, you won't be fertile. That happened. So they adopted Lloyd Miller, one of the, one of the uh, children uh, of, of, of my, my grandfather's brother. I mean, actually, Lloyd Miller looked like, like, very much like me. I, I have a p picture of a whole group picture. I mean, it's just striking, like, almost a, a dead ringer for, for me, or I was for him, so, or as I used to say, spitting image. All right, so it's in this context of, of the loss of seven children. I mean, no wonder if they, they, they were gravitated towards this extreme religiosity. And, and my, my, the, the way my grandfather became a preacher was he had a nail fly up from one of the machines in his, his, his woodworking factory where he had a lathe and, and, uh, electric grills and so on. It was driven by um, an electric motor, big flywheel sunk into the ground. And 
in the in the basement, and a big web drove all the machines, the drills, the the lathe, everything in in the in the shop. That was his factory where he made this porch porch columns. So, in this extreme poverty, my father was was born. He was born. As a blue baby, you know, he, was, he was born basically dead. My grandfather breathed the breath of life into his lungs, and he coughed and and started breathing. But I mean, he, he was born. Is that what was called a blue baby? Now, turns out in this town, a doctor, the, the doctor who was the obstetrician, was losing all. The children he delivered from childbed the fever because he was probably not using sanitary methods. So my my grandparents, my grandmother's name was Matilda. Her maiden name was Matilda Fenstermacher, May Fenstermacher, May May Van Vactor, very very pretty, blonde, who, whose family was came from Rhinesfall, where the origin of the Rhine River. In the, in, in the Alps. My father visited the Rhinesfall. Ron, Did felt. he find any, any co uh, cousins? No, no. Uh, and they had no cousins in, in, in uh, Swiss Germany. Um, but he felt this incredible presence, this kind of atavistic feeling of, of being, you know, back in, in this like the avatars, when he and my mother visited Rhinesfall. Um, now, my father had a very tempestuous life. He, every month he'd have these periodic rages uh, because he was extremely disappointed in his ambitions and to, to get the recognition he deserved. I mean, he won the New York Philharmonic Prize and conducted his first symphony in D there uh, in 1939, six weeks after I was born. My grandfather, who was a successful businessman in the railway supply business in Chicago, hired a private car and took out the whole family and all their friends to New York and had a big, big celebration after my father came back from that perform his the first performance which he conducted in New York Philharmonic. So John Barbarelli was the conductor at that time. And he had submitted the work under a fictitious name, David Nabrotka, to confuse him and, and had it sent in by somebody by mail so they didn't know where it came from. I mean, it came from Chicago, but I should sent, went to the post office and it was not, had no return address. But he won the first prize, uh, and a friend of his won um, a, an honorable mention in that competition. It was no longer, that competition was no longer offered uh, after that. A, friend of, a good, close friend of his, Robert Sander, won honorable mention for a little, something called a little symphony. And then his former composition teacher at Northwestern, um, Mark Wessel, won honorable mention also for, for a, 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 a symphonietta or something. Uh, I said I said that my father's life was tempestuous. Um, he, he he was a a very serious alcoholic. I mean, he literally drank about uh, 17 ounces of of uh, bourbon whiskey. And then after he retired in 1972 from the university and from the symphony orchestra, he'd go out to lunch and he'd drink. 
beef eaters. So, I mean, altogether, he probably put away about 20 ounces of hard liquor a day. And then often, he, after, especially after a concert, he, you know, he'd be drinking boilermakers of, you know, shots of bourbon and then followed by Heineken's beer. I mean, we always had cases of Heineken's beer, in the, you know, ready to put in their cool. Um, he's got, he was, he started the fine arts department at the University of Tennessee, art and music. There had been no conservatory in the town of Knoxville, and he conducted what was an amateur orchestra, made it into a very competent semi-professional orchestra. Most of the major players in the, in the, in the orchestra also taught at the university, their instrument or something else. And um, he was uh, removed as chairman of the department, head of the department, although he started it, but I think it was because of some of his infidelities with some of the graduate schools and some of the younger women in the orchestra. I mean, I remember going out to Dean Hill Country Club, which was sort of the second best country club in Knoxville, Cherokee being the best, which we go on to later, with some of these these young women whom, who were madly in love with my father. And while my mother was in Chicago, going out to Dean Hill with them, you know, sitting through the long dinners as a little boy, um, you know, nine years old, and uh, not really aware of what was going on. But, you know, they were, they were obviously pretty chummy with my father, and uh, he delighted to be with them. You know, he's a great charmer, very handsome, almost six feet tall, blue-eyed, and a very strong man. Having run my grandmother's farm during the war in Marshall, near Marshall, Missouri, uh, and worked in the lumber yard to put himself at Northwestern, he was a great track man, could do the 100-yard dash in 10 seconds flat. He could jump um, almost six feet, high jump. He did the high hurdle. In fact, I'm calling the, the biography High Hurdler. He was an incredible optimist. Everything he wanted to do, he did. He, he wrote his, took, it took him three years to write his, his first symphony, his symphony in D, and which he did during, on vacation, in the summer vacation, uh, or after work. He, he, he played in the Chicago Symphony uh, and taught at Northwestern, taught uh, harmony, first year harmony, and conducted the, the chamber orchestra. And uh, he always had three jobs. I mean, he conducted the Knoxville Symphony for 25 years, and, then, and as I said, made it into a very competent symphony. I mean, they had it. They were so loud, so loud houses. It was always, the, the hall was always full. And because he brought great soloists there, uh, people like uh, Eleanor Stever, uh, Rudolf Hakushmi, um, Ricardo Ricci, um, who was a stand-in for uh, Heifetz, who couldn't make it. Um, he uh, brought other, he, he, he co recorded other American composers on a Ford Foundation grant, uh, Gilbert Trisall's First Symphony, and a symphony by a composer named Bodo, I don't hear very much of recently, and also the um, uh, Gunther Schiller's uh, uh, pieces of based on the pictures of Paul Flay. This is a picture of him graduating from Northwestern. I think with his mother. Um,
even though he was put out of his job as head of the department, and I think either because of his his uh, the people's knowledge that he was having affairs with, was, uh, was, uh, the, uh, the, one of the one of the women was a uh, played viola, and I think taught in the department. That's what he's working on his last symphony as a picture I took of it, sitting next to the swimming pool. I used to be, I, 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 I've been extremely angry with him because of his infidelities, because of how much, because my mother knew about them, and, and um, I mean, one time when she came back, we had uh, his copyist, George Devine, who was a professor at the University of Musicology, and his wife, babysitting me and my sister. We were waiting for him to come back and go down to the, the um, LNN station to pick up my mother from coming back from Chicago. He never, he didn't come back. We didn't know where he was. We had no worry. We called around people like William Starr, who was his concert master. Where was he? My mother came, finally, came back from the station and we went, got in her car, went over and pulled him out of the clutches of the violist, whose name I won't mention, um, and he was drunk, came home, you know, it was a family tragedy. I, I mean, you cannot imagine the feeling of, of, of shame and, and, uh, and worry that came over me. I mean, I go to sleep with these horrible events after these tirades that you go into. Um, I wake up in the morning, horrible, like with this that kind of hangover you have from waking after a horrible fight or something between your parents. I mean, I was always afraid they were going to get divorced. It'd probably been better for my mother if they had, but thought they would just great calamity, feared, always terror, the terrorized, always terrorizing. Um, so, I, I just finished uh, going over an essay I wrote on what I call the ultimate tragic act, the use of suicide in Greek tragedy and in modern novels as a climactic event. Um, his, his life could have ended in tragic, and I know exactly the point. Uh, he left a restaurant with my son, his grandson, Davy, and his best friend, Gregor ba ba Bowman, Bauman, Calvin Bauman's son, who was an organist who later went, left the University of Tennessee and went to Notre Dame. Um, to teach. Gregor and Davy were in the car. He came out of the restaurant having had beer for dinner and um, got into his 190 SL Mercedes convertible, pulled into traffic, into the traffic lane, fast lane, and was hit by a car, right, which collapsed the front wheel, hit the right front, uh, probably just, you know, three feet from where David was sitting in the passenger seat. He and Gregor and David could have been killed. Now, this happened to a friend of mine's grandfather, N.C. Wyeth, the great illustrator who was the father of Andrew Wyeth, one of our great painters, was, who had a tremendous exhibit found, uh, sponsored by the Bismarck Foundation in Paris uh, a year ago. 
I knew I, I played football and I graduated from Lawrenceville School with Denny McCord, who uh, played fullback. I, we both played fullback for Lawrenceville. Won a big game against our rival, the Hill School. Um, then he made a video of his family talking over this tra the great tragedy in NCYS life and in their life, which was Andrew's son was in the car when NCYS, the grandfather, took out his grandson and got stalled on a tracks and was hit by a train, and, and uh, Andrew's son was killed. All the the wife's daughters, NC's daughters, were wonderful painters. They and they married painters. Uh, Denny McCord's father, who was a great Arizona realist painter, but the two daughters were terrific painters, very successful. Andrew Wise um, worked for DuPont. He got something like 17 patents on things he invented. I mean, he was brilliant. I mean, not only a great painter, but I mean, he's a, he's a many patents to his name. So working at DuPont, um, you know, they lived down there in, in sort of in DuPont country in, in Pennsylvania. Um, that's where all the Helga paintings were done. My father was a great hunter, too. We had 360 shotguns, rifles, pistols, and a lot of antique, of my antique gun collection. We had about 360 guns in the closet next to my bedroom. The whole closet. Upstairs closet. They were all stacked, and you know, either in their gun cases, well taken care of. Um, you did not need permits to have a gun in those days. Then I sold that whole collection for about $300 to pay for my first divorce. Um, my father in his bathroom, my sister, and uh, myself. I, I love my father intensely. He was a very affectionate demonstrative. He was a great support to me as his son, because I recovered from rheumatic fever. He took me to, I went to another school because I missed a year of school, first grade. Went to a wonderful private school called Pembroke Country Day in Kansas City when he was assistant conductor of the Kansas City, Kansas City Philharmonic and started his own orchestra called Allied Arts Orchestra and uh, was teaching at the Conservatory of Music in Kansas City. Um, and, and, and then during the summers, farming my grandmother's farm. In, near Marshall, Missouri, 108 acres, corn, soybeans, and 25 head of Hereford white-faced cattle, and Hampshire hogs. I had my 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 hog, my pig was called Strawberry. She was a beautiful, beautiful pig, and. Um, Many, many stories about the farm, but I'm just saying, with all the, the, the alcohol, my father also smoked three packs of cigarettes a, a day and did not get cancer of the lungs, although there was a spot on the lung, but as, as, as many people know. Cancer doesn't really grow after a certain age. This, this victim is a certain age; it doesn't won't, it won't grow in the body. 
N nothing really happened with that spot on the front of mine. Oh. But he lived to almost 88 and, and died in, in Los Angeles. Um, the last thing he said before he died, he had sort of, I think, a, the old man's friend. Yeah, I think he had a, a, a mild pneumonia. Uh, the young man who had been there to help, last thing he said to him, see you tomorrow, Eddie. And uh, died about six o'clock at night. I was in Virginia with my family, looking at, uh, going to look at some graves that I heard of my, my uh, aunt, Anna Catherine, went back to Malloy. I uh, had found in Harpers Ferry, Virginia. We go to Harpers Ferry and then we got this call that my father had died. So we, we were in Philadelphia the next day. Didn't, did, didn't you get out to Charlottesville to see the family plantation house, Delmede, um, which is now their country club in Charlottesville. We did get out there because we had to go back to Boston. And then I eventually I had to go to LA to with my mother and sister. My sister was dying of, of pancreatic cancer at, at that time, and um, uh, was t just devastated by the, the loss of my father. But there's a picture of her right there, so she's with us. She's with us now. Um, I mean, I, th I think I understand my father's infidelities, although, I mean, I, I've, I've seen my mother having hysterics, crying and I unable to stop crying, and, and unable to get her breath, so we'd have to help her to get undressed, to get into a warm tub of water to calm down, and talking of suicide, talking of suicide. My sister. <clears throat> I mean, I, 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 I think I understand how he could let himself be unfaithful to my mother and to, to let her find out about his lo love affairs. I mean, one, one thing, I, William Starr, who was a devout Catholic, uh, told me that once um, the man who, who was married to one of my father's lovers came walking into the uh, the building at the University of Tennessee where they held their their Knoxville Symphony rehearsals, saying. Where's Dave Van Bachter? He's having an affair with my wife. And Bill said, he hasn't arrived yet. Fortunately, Daddy didn't show up and have to confront this man. But, weirdly, he invited this man to go duck hunting with us uh, probably the next year. I came home from Lawrenceville on the Christmas vacation, and I had to ride with, with this man in, the, in this uh, suit. Uh, down uh, through to Chattanooga, through the, across the top of Alabama. You know, my father driving about uh, 80 miles an hour to get over to Memphis and cross the river to the White River to the swamp country where we went duck hunting. Next to me is this man who's in a rage, trembling rage. And he's going to stand next to me in the, in the, in the duck blind, you know, with his shotgun loaded, I, I brought a pistol, strapped it to my side, a, a, a 38 pistol, which I had loaded, and if he tried to shoot my father, I would have shot him, and of course I would have ruined my life. But I was sitting next to this man, and what put my father, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what he thought he was accomplishing, but inviting Jack, who later had an, a love affair with, with my sister, I uh, hope it uh, 
got, got some of his anger out of it. Um, and so I had to stand in the black, dark blind, you know, with him between me and my father, who was uh, in front of us, you know, with our guys doing the duck line, whack, 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 you know, as the ducks would circle before they plop down. Here you are with your guns poking out and, and you know, following the ducks, you know, leading them. And, uh, and I was a pretty good shot, you know. I don't know. We didn't do too well that trip. That wasn't, that was the worst year of duck hunting. Then we went out there in the, in our car, and we, you know, look for doves and everything. Anything else we just shoot, you know. Uh, we bring home these beautiful, beautiful mallard ducks, and he wraps them in this red cellophane. We give them as Christmas presents to some of our friends, you know, wild duck from from Arkansas. We did that about three Christmases, but uh, then he didn't buy one of these these bitches down. No, one, of, one of them was an opera singer. And, uh, and, you know, because he knew all the operas. He produced uh, Tra uh, Traviata, he produced Hansel and Gretel in Oslo, and uh, 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 Traviata. He'd been at one of his jobs working his way through Northwestern was at Ravinia Park as, as an usher during the the, uh, the Chicago Opera summer season, you know, where Mary Garden was, a, was a, one, of the, one of the stars. So he he knew all the operas from having gone, you know, with his friend Oswald McConaughey, who later became an opera conductor in Boston with Sarah Paul. Uh, <coughs> My father knew all the literature. He spoke uh, perfect Spanish and German because the, the Chicago Orchestra, when he was in it, was basically a German orchestra. And at one point, the conductor tapped his his, uh, his uh, music stand. He said, "Gentlemen, from from now on, this is 1942. English will be." the language spoken in the Chicago Orchestra. And one of the trombone players leaded, leaned over to his colleague and said, Was hat er gesagt? Which means, what, what did he say? <coughs> Still speaking German. Uh, and this stood him in very good stead because he recorded all his major pieces with the Frankfurt Radio Orchestra. And he and all the conducting he did in Santiago de Chile, you had to speak Spanish to be conductor. I mean, to speak the language of the orchestra to conduct an orchestra, because basically rehearsing is is teaching, teaching the orchestra a piece, you know, to make it to make it really work. A dramatic, a dramatic performance it takes a conductor to show the structure of the piece and where they're great. The, and then all the dynam dynamics, which means that any uh, pianissimos or, or uh, any, any crescendos, to, 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 to build all that, to make it emotionally powerful. You have to speak the language. And he had Spanish and German. <coughs> I'm just listen to his uh, first symphony today and his third symphony while I was reading, reading through and correcting my essay on tragedy. Okay, I think that's all, that's all for today. No, keep going. Keep going with that. I'm getting more pictures. Okay. I, I have a a, uh, about a 12-page piece I, I could read, but uh, I, I, I'll just tell it. I'll tell it. Um, my father had some transchemic 
attack some minor strokes, but uh, he 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 was he was not handicapped. He was not no paralysis. Uh, he uh, didn't do much reading in the five years before he died in, in, in 1994. When he moved to LA and was living in Century uh, City uh, in a in a gated uh, apartment. Uh, building with a view of the San Gabriel Mountains in the distance and a nice swimming pool, which he didn't use. He, uh, he didn't venture a lot of conversation. You have, I'd have to ask him questions. Once I was playing him some Puccini artists, and I was talking about what a great life Puccini must have had, uh, what good cooking he must have had from his mother, you know, all the beautiful women he must have had access to the opera singer. Uh, and then, then we start talking about Verdi, Verdi, how Verdi turned to the works of Shakespeare and, and, and Otello. And, uh, and, and he, having done Tra La Traviata, uh, he knew Verdi w well. And then I, I asked him, uh, Daddy, what do you think, what's your favorite? What do you think the best Verdi opera is? His little twinkle in his eye said, he said, well, kind of like a piece of ass in a way they're all good. And then, and then when he was 87, I said, Daddy, you've been alive 87 years. What do you think of this life? Wonderful, he said, wonderful. And I said, Daddy, I know you think a lot of Argus when, when you're, you're lying in bed and so what do you think about? It? Said Mama's cooking. Mama's cooking. He just, I don't know. He just had a great. I mean, we had more fun. We listened to music together. Uh, you know, always we listened to something like a book or symphony. And I'd hold his hand. We squeeze his hand, and there were great moments of crescendo, very moving moment. I said, Dad. I said, why does that make me almost want to cry? Because he just modulated from E to, to, to F. I mean, he just knew everything. You'd ask him any question about music, he'd give you right the answer. He, he could, to conduct an orchestra, you have to be able to transpose instantaneously from every key, every instrument in the orchestra. And uh, he wrote, Never needed to go to the piano. He wrote uh, his last symphonies. Um, it was done like Beethoven. When Beethoven was, was deaf and wrote the Ninth Symphony. Uh, it was all here. He could hear it all in his head and or see it. And he also always conducted from memory all the major repertoire, all the Beethoven. Major symphony is a Mozart symphony uh, from memory. He had a pho discovery, he had a photographic memory, and uh, um, always conducted from memory. And he'd always, I remember he'd, three months before every performance, he'd get out the scores of the works he was conducting, go over them, and then, uh, you know, the night of the concert, he'd come down and his tails and white tie, always had these beautiful clothes, you know, fresh iron, uh, dress shirts, and uh, looked great in his tails. I mean, he had enough height. He wasn't six foot four like his, his, his father or his uncle, Abraham Lincoln, then director. Uncle Link, who was murdered out in Colorado in a land dispute. I mean, this family was just fantastic. And all these men who came back from the war ruined from mustard gas got on opium and were addicts. And my grandfather had to get them all. Get them 
you know, to sit with them uh, through the nights of, of agony, pain, a lot of pain, um, to get them to come off of the opal. And this is what my father grew up with. It wasn't his own addictions to, to cigarettes and, and alcohol, but... <clears throat> and how he could have, with seven of his, his uh, seven children and one family dying of, of consumption, how could he smoke and, and, and threaten his lungs, which his whole livelihood depended on? But I mean, he's also great track man, you know. But always run ten miles before breakfast. Come home, throw up, throw up. Come home, have breakfast. And uh, also, during they 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 let out they let let sent children home during the uh, Spanish influenza epidemic in 1914. So Shul was out for about five weeks. But what did he and his best friend do? They started trapping uh, and started a business of trapping mink and other uh, other uh, furry uh, furry animals in the streams, setting traps and uh, and uh, curing the hot, the pelts which they would sell for probably $25 a piece, a mink. Um, and that helped them put food on the table. Also, he was fishing and hunting with his single shot twenty two. He'd go out hunting to, to, get, to have some birds or rabbits put on the table. For, and he'd go to the butcher and, and for five cents he'd buy enough steak to feed the family. Five cents. Count of a thousand people. First job was peeling, peeling potatoes for the war effort. You know, boiling hot potatoes with his little fingers. And then the town barber taught him how to play flute and piccolo. And he got a job in the town band and got a check every week. First, first time, first band concert. His father had gone out to buy some lath for his factory, or something he was building, and uh, he went to the next town to get some, some lumber, and they were late getting home. So my father got down from, from the wagon they were, they were, their horse was pulling, and uh, he ran home. You know, looking at his watch, it's almost five when the concert was going to start. Runs home, you know, you know, a couple of miles home, probably downhill by this time, and runs into his bedroom, and on his dresser was lay, his mother had laid out all his clean shirts and pants, but dons all his clothes, gets his piccolo, and show, gets to the band to the band just in time as they're giving the, the downbeat. That was his first band concert. And that he did, you know, eight years, he was eight years old. And then he, then he worked in the drugstore. And he told the story of the little girl who came, come by and always looking at him. He's a soda jerk, he's probably making chocolate sundaes or something. Or, or, um, the ice cream sodas when they'd have that spritzer with with carbonated water and then foam up, you know, and put cream on top and everything. And this this girl this girl kept looking at him from this walking by on the sidewalk and finally she motioned him around the back and he went met her in the back of the drugstore and apparently she pulled up her dress and he, he got laid. She he said she had freckles all over her body. I mean, he used to take me fishing and tell me about all his uh, his erotic conquests, and you know, I never had the, the gumption to say, Daddy, you know, I really wish, wouldn't mind if you didn't tell me that. It makes me feel uncomfortable.
I, I just, I, I, I just would listen. And uh, Howard got his, uh, when, when, when they, when, uh, my, my grandfather made this bargain with God when, after the uh, nail flew up and put out his left eye. And uh, this, the pain was so horrendous. He, he prayed and said, if, if the Lord would take away the pain, he would become a preacher, which, which happened. So they had, he had a church, uh, you know, probably not too far from the house. And uh, there was another preacher who came to town and tried to get it away from him. Uh, and he had seven churches, which he wrote sermons for, typed out, longhand. This is my grandfather, David Elsie, is that guy. Six foot four, and uh, only went to eighth grade. He invented a, the pogo stick airplane that flew straight up, and then the 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 seat on swivels would. Then it would fly horizontally. He got he he, he uh, wrote to the government printing office and made himself a patent lawyer, and he and he got five claims on this invention of his uh, at the American at the U.S. Patent Office. When he, by the before he died, he was seventy-five years old, with and prostate infection, not cancer, but just an infection. The surgeon used a d dirty instrument, and uh, uh, started to talk about how, because of the doctor who was losing babies in Oregon, my grandparents became learned midwifery, and they delivered about 300 kids. I mean, so as a preacher, he was not only delivering children, but uh, baptizing. I mean, and I, and I just imagine this: my father, at the age of 12 woke up at six in the morning and three men take him out in the cold and to a river and my his father baptizes him probably fully immersed in ice cold water and um, you know and I'm sure my father heard heard uh, sermons saying our Lord said that if you even thought of a woman in, with, with lust, you were guilty of adultery. You had committed adultery. Well, he probably heard that sermon, and my father probably just thought, "Fool you to that! I, I, that's just uh, the most wonderful thing in life is a or, is a beautiful woman." And uh, they they couldn't; these women couldn't keep their hands off. I mean, he actually had. Students from the university come and try to do proposition, and um, one time, and I think it was also I think also my grandmother, May was was extremely uh, moral about uh, a sexual transgression of any, any kind of carnal law. I mean, one time I don't know why. Uh, this this girl at Northwestern had, had come up and said that she wanted him to be her first, and, and that she made this this assignation with him, and he told his mother about it, and she said, "There's no way that I could condone you doing that." She said, "She, she he should not do it," so he never went, and he. Later, saw the girl on the steps, you know, going into a class. And the girl came up and bit him right on the cheek. She was so angry at him. Drew blood. And I, I think it's because of that kind of extreme uh, Christian morality that he rebelled. He was an infidel. He was he rebelled. And I mean, one time. When he was on tour with the Woodwind Quintet, uh, the North, uh, Nelson Rockefeller had sent down to South America, uh, toured all over 
every country in South America, including Chile, Argentina, uh, uh, Brazil, even Trinidad, uh, they were, even my mother were at a party in a high rise in Mexico City. My mother looked around and couldn't, didn't know where he was. She went downstairs, took the elevator, went downstairs and looked in the car. He was in the car banging some blonde girl that he picked up at the party. She told me. But why does why does why did I feel angry at him for it? Because basically, if he just thought a little bit, he would know that doing something that would hurt my mother was indirectly hurting me. So why wouldn't he have the sense to think of that? I did get him to stop drinking one time. He went on the way for about two months. He grouchy his hell. I mean, he's now always a hard to live with. He was an obsessive compulsive. I mean, he'd always put down, he said, always put down what's ever in your pocket in one place so you know where it is. You know, your keys, your home, whatever it is you need, your wallet. Um, but he, he was always worrying about things like that. And um, he was always up at about 5.30 in the morning, no matter how much he drank. I mean, he had a great metabolism. He'd burn it up, get up feeling great, never had a hangover, no matter how much he drank. Get up, go down. Make orange juice for him and my mother, and have a, a cup of tea. Stop drinking coffee because it made it too nervous. Always drink Earl Grey tea, which he'd make in a pot in a little, with a little um, ceramic strainer, and um, look out at the beautiful river. We lived on the Tennessee River, look across at the hills and the University Pond, you know, often in the springtime with all the peach trees in bloom. And um, we lived in a gorgeous place. And uh, he was a great carpenter. He he uh, he made shells for all his flute music, all his scores. I mean, he had uh, all the the scores of all the major symphonies, and, uh, and the little pocket Schirmer's pocket scores, and a lot of flute music, which was given to my stepdaughter Jessica, and. Um, he made shells, big shells. Uh, he learned carpentry from his father. I mean, sometimes they'd have trouble with the, the gas motor that, that dro drove the flywheel and all the bands that drove all the, the machines, the drills and lathe, the lathe, and um, uh, all the. Um, and, and so his father would come out and ask him to. My father came out and keep him company. Uh, my father's job was cleaning the chicken house every Saturday, which he hated. Stuck to high heaven. And uh, my, his father made him a little cannon. About how old was he? I mean, when, what's the date? Probably about uh, 2000, I mean, uh, uh, 1909, when he was about uh, uh, nine years old or something. No, he was born 1906. So that old at 1909. Well, I remember he'd be, let's say, he'd be uh, three years old. Three years old. He was already doing chores at three? Yeah. I mean, he, he, and his father made him a little cannon, and he, and the ramrod um, was in, in the, he shot the ramrod through the, through the, the wall of the chicken house, and his father got really, really angry at him. And uh, and one one day a rat got in the chicken house, and the chickens were squawking like crazy. So they ran out there, and they opened the door. The rat ran out, and s ran across the chicken yard, and started up the hill. And my grandfather, blind in his left eye, picked up a brick bat, and at about a hundred yards threw it, and. Hit the, hit the rat and killed it. 
before it could leave their property. I mean, he was incredible. And he also he had a bet in the town that he could put up a house in five weeks. And, and so, uh, you know, people would come around to his workshop, his woodworking shop, and they'd say, well, let's, let's see the house. Let's see how far you got on the house. And he wouldn't show it. He did it all pre that and, and right to the day, he took all the, all the pieces of the house out and put it together, put it in the roof beam, and, uh, and, and won the bet. The incredible. I mean, he went to Chicago. Uh, the old man. Who, I mean, he was born. He was 46 when Daddy was born. Long generations. Uh, so he was about probably about 60 when he, uh, they decided they they better get out of town. They better move to Sh Chicago. Eddie had gone to Northwestern. The reason the kids could go there is there was a ministerial dispensation that they get tuition, I think, off. They didn't have to pay tuition. And they weren't boarding. So they, they went with, with the three daughters, Evelyn and Anna Catherine, who were going to our school in Indianapolis, and moved to Evanston. They rented an apartment building in which my grandfather made these little cubicles about a, um, probably about um, eight by eight, eight feet by eight or something like that, where you could put in a bed and maybe a little desk and a bureau or something. And uh, and had about 19 kids uh, boarding there for whom my grandmother would cook. And um, they'd feed and, and uh, board, room and board. And um, so that's how they got by. I, he tried to he tried he tried to join a carpenters union. The Swedish carpenters wouldn't wouldn't let him. I mean they 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 blackballed him. And then and then when they my mother and father bought their first house where where I came home to which I came home from the hospital Passman Hospital, uh, ten nineteen Hinnon Avenue. Uh, very near the, the lake and near the university. Uh, my grandfather was one day was up on a ladder fixing uh, the roof of the, one of the gutters or something. My father was got furious at him and said, Daddy, you're 74 years old. Get down from that ladder. You could fall. I won't have it. I won't have it. He got really furious at his father. And my grandfather climbed down and said, I got everything under Control, sonny boy. Uh, and uh, he loved my mother. He's not my mother. I think he had a kind of a crush on my mother, my grandfather. I mean, he, he just, they really got along. And my grandmother loved her too because her own daughter, she couldn't keep house properly according to her standards. My mother always, you know, she'd come back, she'd come to her, her, her daughter's houses and there'd be dishes. And sitting in the sink, sink, dirty dishes in the sink. My mother would never do anything like that. Uh, anyway, the only shameful thing is that they had a, uh, I think they had a, what they call a family council. They had a meeting of the family, and she wanted to come live with, with, and after after my grandfather died, my grandmother wanted to come and live uh, with one of her children. But they, none of them would agree to it. I don't know where she died. I don't know where she lived. She lived out her last year. She, she died, I think, about 74. That's horrible. I, I thought it was horrible, too. Um, and uh, I have pictures of her holding me. And uh, I don't know where those pictures are. No, but I mean, I have some pictures back, maybe back in Boston, in mm -hmm. Cambridge. I have a lot of wonderful pictures of my father. And a lot of in that box of it. In that box there's a lot of pictures. Wonderful pictures. Um, 
some of which we've just been shown to you. But my father um, went to we went to to answer that on one of our many trips to Europe. I mean, we used to go almost every summer for six summers during my teenage years to, to Europe, so he, my father could look for a conducting job. And that's how he got, uh, he found that he could conduct and record his music and other American composers' music with the Frankfurt Radio Orchestra. And um, he had a, a, he had a, a manager uh, whom he paid, to whom he paid about $450, Frida Ross, and she got him a concert with the London Philharmonia through some uh, agent in, in uh, Amsterdam. So the, the, big, the big event of 1953, my first year at Launchville School, was his conduction of the London Philharmonia. She did an all romantic program about Tchaikovsky's Fourth Symphony. Um, this piano concertos with Robert Kasatsu and um, and the Chausson Symphony, which probably nobody in London has heard, which has a big organ part. Um, it's a wonderful symphony. Um, <coughs> I didn't go. My father and I used to tussle a lot, and I, we were wrestling, and I was actually a wrestler at that point. I broke his rib. I sort of put my elbow through one rib and broke it. And he was scared to death it was going to hurt him. But it, it healed up before the concert. It didn't give him any trouble. But I think his big mistake is that he should use that, that engagement with it. London Philharmonia, which may have been the best orchestra in the world at that time. I mean, it was surely as good as the Philadelphia or the Boston Symphony. Um, to conduct his first symphony with that orchestra, because if he had, he might have been known all over Europe because of that. He got good reviews for his concert, but, uh, you know, he never again was asked to conduct that orchestra. Oh, should have conducted his own symphony. Because there was no better symphony written at that time, although I love the, the Roy Harris Third Symphony. I don't think it's a better symphony, but it's surely one of the best American pieces written during those years. I think I was pretty well said what I wanted to say. Well, regarding his infidelities, my mother used to talk about them to me, sort of like driving a wedge between me and him, and uh, I, I really did not like having to listen to her angry uh, references to his infidelities, his women. But after he died, she never mentioned it again. She obviously had forgiven him totally. And she spoke with extreme pride to uh, Jessica's uh, mother and father-in-law, the Madeiruses, when they came to them, because they had lived in Kansas City. And they knew a lot of people in common. And uh, <clears throat> she spoke with extreme pride about being a perfect artist's wife. She made everything possible for him. She paid all the bills. She had, she watched the investments and did well in the stock market. So they had enough money that they could go to Europe. Um, and he could, I mean, he didn't make much money from either the symphony or the university, although the university did up its salary at the end. The, the symphony never had enough money to really pay a decent salary. 
I don't think he was ever making over about 17000 a year with both of those jobs, the symphony and the orchestra. I mean, the university and the orchestra. Um, and uh, one of the best things I ever did, I was out in L.A. and I saw a, a record that Everest Records produced, and I looked on it and I and I, and I saw the address that was in, they were in, uh, on Wilshire in Westwood. So I called up uh, Everest Records, talked to the owner, Kevin Cornfield, who had owned Baroque Records up in Montreal before he moved to L.A. And I got an appointment, and I had the tapes that my father had brought back from, from Frankfurt the year before, and I went in there with the tapes, he puts them on immediately. He's just absolutely loved them. He bought ten records. He, he put out ten records. He did, did everything that was recorded. I mean, um, First Symphony, Viola Concerto, and then my father had written these 36 pieces for Woodwind. Um, and the four etudes for winds and percussion, the ode from the Second Symphony. And it just it just went like you know I I I didn't say to myself uh, I don't, you know I, I wasn't nervous about it because I was absolutely uh, absolutely convinced my of the, of the of the worth of my father's my father's pieces I love my father's music and I and, and he played through once he had a sketch on pencil. The, the harmonized sketch of, of the piece, he'd pick it out for me on the piano, he, he couldn't play very well, and talk about the structure and what he was trying to do. Every piece he ever wrote, he went through it with me that way. So, anyway, so, I didn't think, you know, I never, when I thought, I sh well, maybe, maybe uh, Reverse Records might be interested, uh, you know, I didn't have seconds, I was like, well, but, what if they've never heard of him, or, or uh, what if they're going to ask, has any major symphony played his work? And so, well, they there had been the Pittsburgh, uh, Willem Steinberg, the Pittsburgh symphony that played his, his uh, uh, it was then his second symphony, and now it's listed as his third symphony. Why? Huh? Why? Because that's, actually there was a piece in between, and uh, so, um, yeah, I was a, a I was a uh, <coughs> junior at Harvard at, that year. That it was played, and then the uh, Louisville Orchestra played. In 1958, they played uh, his Fantasia, Chacon and Allegro, and uh, recorded it also on LP. And uh, <coughs> so, you know, I never had. You know, I was not, never a naysayer, never, never a person who could think of a reason not to do something. You, you know, if you want to do something, you got to try it. If you don't try it, there, there never, there'll never be a possibility. I mean, I mean, basically, my, I came from people who thought everything was possible. All those people in St. Louis, the Redmonds and my, my Rolandres, you know, and the, who were in the mining business and the mining supply business, later the oil business, the idea was everything is possible. If you don't try it, how do you ever know? It won't work. So you go and you do it. And I, and I was, uh, I went and took over the family business in, in Chicago. Yeah, but that was your mother's making you, you know, trap. Uh, fool your uncle into well, why don't you tell the story? No, I, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, anyway. But that was destructive. No, but I mean, he was it was a big thing was, for me. Your uncle was stealing from your, your your side of the family and you went in there to, to dismantle But he had left operation. the business. There was no family member on the uh, at, at present. 
on the premises. I was the only family member. I went and took over that business and I got it in great shape, you know, with new products. And we had a lease, which we were responsible to pay rent on. And somebody came in and paid us $35,000, took over the lease, took over some, some of the inventory. And, uh, <clears throat> You know, it would have been easy to say to myself, you know, we're, we're losing 50000 a month. You know, we're losing like 250000 a year. And uh, because we weren't getting any orders, then we started getting orders. And the, we brought the, the whole workforce, these women were working on this big high power sewing machine, back to work. And pretty soon we were shipping out boxcars of our product, you know, spring packing, out to Santa Fe, Burlington, Railroad, uh, Great Northern, all that. And, uh, I, I, you know, I go call on purchasing agents that just walk up Michigan Avenue, where we had our offices across from the Art Institute uh, in, in Grant Park, and, and walk up Michigan Avenue, go into a building, look in the directory, go up in the elevator and knock on the door. Call on every major company in the world who had their, their offices in Chicago. It takes guts to try to sell something. But if you, if you know your product, if you're down there at the factory watching it being made, and, and uh, you know, you have your eye on the balance sheet, on the, all the accounting stuff, you know, where the money is going and how it's being spent, and uh, watching it come in, supervising the tax, tax reports, all that. I learned so much for that one, one year in Chicago. And, uh, you know, I think it, when, I, when Pat, Pat and I started our publishing company, it really helped me have the confidence to know I could run a business. And then when I started my writing arts research, in which I gave trained teachers on how to teach write, expository writing, you know, teachers from all over the Northeast, you know, in 30 different school systems, you know, in New Jersey, all over Massachusetts, even out to Pennsylvania and, and Cleveland, Ohio. The best, best, I think the best workshop I had was in Buffalo. <clears throat> but I mean, I, I did, I went into schools like for three weeks, and, and, the, and the teachers would come in for these all-day workshops called in-service training. And <clears throat> let me see that. Who are these? Why are you feeding Put your glasses on. <clears throat> yeah, I don't recognize it. That's you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's your name. Oh, yeah. God, I don't even recognize it. Anyway, <clears throat> I guess that's enough for now. It's a good start. I, I'll just end with one thing. Um, <clears throat> one winter in nor northern Indiana in August, it snowed and all the fields were iced over. What, what was the date? Probably. Uh, <clears throat> about 1916 or something. I mean, yeah, 16. So this is a story your dad told you. Yeah. And and so they put on skates and they could skate across the fields. It was covered with ice. Skate across the field. You know, with their little primitive ice skates. And... Uh, 
I don't know if he ever played hockey or anything, but he played basketball for the high school and also um, ran track. He ran track at Northwestern. He used to do the high hurdles and high jump, long jump. He did, did the 100 yard dash and 10 flat. I mean, one of my friends, Ty Porter, used to do it in nine six. I mean, that was before. I mean, people, you know, people like Paul Lewis would probably do it about even faster than that. <clears throat> I got a lot down, didn't I? Hmm? I wonder how how to look. You have to go over it later. See what. You may you decided do you, you know how to edit it? I don't know if I'll edit it.